Sarah died the first week of November. Maria didn't look like anything was the matter with her, but she had a head injury and her brain stem and her and, and she died that way. She Thank you so much for coming today. I'm just, happy to see you. I'm happy to see you too. Why don't you share with me a little bit about your story? So my story, my story started really well. Three gorgeous daughters, nice husband. I lost my oldest daughter, Maria, in a car accident when she was in high school. At that time, I learned a little bit how to handle grief. A little bit. It took a long time to sort of figure out how to be joyful, but also I had two other little girls, so I didn't have a whole lot of, I didn't have the luxury of being pitiful. Mm -hmm. So, and I guess I also believed at that time that if I survived that, I would have smooth sailing from here on out because that, that was enough. And then five years ago, my second daughter, Sarah, died. Her heart just quit. And now I have one surviving daughter. And what I know about that is I even have less luxury to be pitiful because she needs me so much. Mm -hmm. So, Tell me a little bit about each daughter. Let's Maria, first of all. Yeah. Maria, your oldest daughter. My oldest daughter. She would be... Oh my gosh, she would be 45 right now. She was born the day after Christmas in 1972. As you know, Kelly, mm -hmm. she didn't look like anything I ever thought she would look like. Her she dad had beautiful. red hair and brown eyes. <laughs> I had black hair and brown eyes. And she had blue eyes and blonde hair and she was slight. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, who are you? Yeah. Like, Where'd you come from? <laughs> I thought most of my kids would look Hispanic, <laughs> you know, because so, that's kind of what I look like. So. Um, so, and she was sweet and smart, a horrible athlete. So, as we didn't find out till later, when Sarah came along, who was very Irish looking, she was fair skinned and blue eyed. My first two daughters had blue eyes. She was a fabulous athlete. As time went on, I, I know her dad and I used to like argue who got to go to Sarah's games and who had to go to Maria's games because <laughs> all they did was fix their ribbons. <laughs> well, you know, and chat and they didn't like do that. that. Fun. So, uh -huh. um, good girls. Maria was very focused and studious, and Sarah was very much of a hurricane and out there and creative, and she had a big presence in the room. Five years later, after Sarah was born, I had Laura, and she was just a joy and probably spoiled because she had two big sisters that just carried her around and never put her down, and mm -hmm. she's a very good girl. Yeah. yeah. Maria got into a car accident. Right. What, there were eight kids in the car, I think? Seven or eight kids in the car? Um, I think so, and there was a little horseplay. I guess the car rolled. Yeah. Then came out pretty unscathed. Maria didn't look like anything was the matter with her, but she had a head injury and her brain stem. And she's in the hospital and she looks just like herself. She doesn't look like she's even hurt, but she's not responding. And they start talking about transplants. I sign yes to transplants, but of course I say, but not until I decide she's not coming back. Like, don't be starting to prep her just yet. Let me decide. We do know that her corneas were used for somebody for sight. Let's talk about Sarah a little bit. Sarah died the first week of November. Laura, Sarah, and I were going to go to Chicago at the end of the week for my birthday. Called her Monday, she didn't answer. And Laura said, hmm, she hasn't texted me. I mean, I've, she's not answered my text on that. So Laura said, I'm going over there. So then we went over there. She found Lucy roaming the house. Lucy could forage for herself. Lucy she, was three. Lucy was three, but she had a little tea set where she filled up with water and she found some Cheerios, so she wasn't dehydrated. Tommy was horribly dehydrated and laying in bed, which she had been laying in bed, I guess, from Sunday afternoon until Tuesday morning when Laura got them. And he was dehydrated and he was laying in his own mess and in his baby bed. She was 38. And... Yeah. Yeah. You know, as you look at other mothers... <clears throat> 
um, who have lost children, who have gone through, you know, they're, as we talked about, toolboxes might not all be the same. What do you, what do you do? Um, I think just get a active, yeah. stay out of bed to start with. Stay just out of bed. Just get up and stay out of bed until it was actually time to go to bed. Well, I just had to like start paying attention again. I had to be a good mom, not just a pretend good mom. I actually had to be a good mom. So, so that that was my focus. Laura was easy. Sarah was harder. So, just so talk about being age. a good mom. What does what does that <sighs> mean to you? Be engaged. Mm -hmm. um, pay attention to what they're feeling and then learning like what they're feeling is like totally different than what you're feeling right so they're suffering with grief as well a different kind of grief like like sarah didn't want to have friends come over because she didn't want to explain her story talk to me about your toolbox as well as how you help others identify that their toolbox what their toolboxes look like I'm just learning this. This mm -hmm. is one I'm really learning because my experience at the American Cancer Society where I thought I could be compassionate to everybody and own everybody's stories was exhausting. So after my first couple months there, I had to pull back and try to, what I thought, give folks tools to work their own navigation. Mm -hmm. So I defined what the tools were and then I would give them, whether it was the number for their social worker or their doctor or a book on your cancer treatment. And a lot of times those tools didn't work because those were my organizational tools, not what they did. So, and we talked about this a little bit that I would hand people a toolbox and then I'd get so frustrated because I felt like they were sucking my energy out because they didn't use the toolbox I gave them, you know? Right. And then I started thinking about that after we talked and I thought, well, if somebody gave me a toolbox to put this table together, I'd be like, oh. I don't That's know how nice. to use that tool. <laughs> so right. you can give people things so my that they don't know how to use. So then maybe you stay committed to teach them to use that a little bit. So for my grandkids and for Laura, whether it is learning to identify what their loves are or what their fears are, how to get over some of those fears, how to get to where they want to go, how to enter a room without being so shy that you don't get what you need from that room, mm. you know, or, or whatever it is. But sure. that's learn. That's, that's a, I got a lot to learn before I'm done. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot there. You have left lots of people with lots of joy and lots of ways to understand, certainly empathy, compassion, living through something that nobody should live through once and you've lived through it twice. Those are some of the things in terms of legacy. If somebody looked at your life, what do you want them to feel when? Oh, it would be nice if my loves, my family, my friends um, would think, or if I could, you know, that toolbox I'm talking about all the time. If I could leave my loves, those things in their toolbox that they need to be okay. These women's stories are so impactful. Eris Sisters creates opportunities for women.